Foundation does.
people that we serve a God that's in control. Right. Like Pastor says, you know, God needs our trust in us. He's in control. We don't have to worry about that. We know that no matter what, you know, God's going to take care of his people and we're going to be okay. Worship like this as we sing this next song.
anything that's breathing can praise God. But, you know, as they were singing those songs, I began to think of an old song that I used to sing. It said, uh, you know, take me back to the heart of worship. Anything can put breath and praise the Lord, but we worship God with our hearts. Amen. If you all stay with me, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer, but I wonder if we couldn't, before we pray and make these requests known, I wonder if we could just begin to lift our hands to God, begin to worship Him with our heart. Worship Him for who He is. Amen. He's the one and only true living God. Beside Him, there is no other. He is high and lifted up. Amen. And He is victorious. He is righteous. He is holy. He is loving and caring and kind and patient. Lord, I love you right now, Jesus. We love you with our whole heart, God. Lord, we worship you, Lord, for who you are. You are so great in our lives, God. You didn't have to do the things you've done for us, Lord, but you've been so gracious, so kind. Lord, we love you. We praise you, God. Hallelujah, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Jesus. It's all about you, God. It's all about you, God. Your will, your desire, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. God is so good, amen. We have a special prayer request for Jaden Smith. Sister Sheila Jones' his grandson is in need of healing. He's in the hospital. Uh, he has uh, a lot of health issues. He is, has a staph infection in his central line and a bacterial inf infection in his bloodstream. So we're going to pray for that need that God would heal him and do the miraculous. Amen. We also want to continue to remember and pray for Sister Patty sister, and also Brother Bill Banks at time of loss, Sister Hernandez, Sister Dorothy Henderson, Sister Stinson. We want to continue to pray for Brother Paul Burnett, Brother Larry Starnes, Brother Gary Kennedy, also Brother Don Compton. Amen. Let's continue to pray for our brothers and sisters in Key West. And also remember the churches in Chile, Argentina, and Spain that the will of the Lord would be, would be done there. Nothing is too hard for our God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together right now. Lord Jesus, we love you and praise you, God. Lord, we lift these prayers up to you right now, Lord. Every word, every spoken and mentioned prayer request, God, we pray that you begin to minister, Lord. That you begin to touch Jaden Smith and his body, God. Lord, that you perform a miracle, Lord. God, that we have given a victory for him, the things that you're doing in his life, Jesus. That he can be home, Lord, and healthy and strong in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray, God, for the churches in Key West, Chile, and Argentina, Spain, Lord, that your hand would be upon them, God. That you work mighty works in their lives, God, and in their churches, Lord, that you bring revival. Lord, a hunger for truth in Jesus' name. That your will be accomplished, God, established in the churches, Lord. God, we pray for this service right now, God, that you administer, Lord, in a mighty way. That there be a, a special anointing upon the speaker tonight, God. Lord, that you administer our hearts and our minds, Lord. We openly, freely give you ourselves, Lord, that you can have a, your work in our soul, God. Touch our hearts, touch our minds, change us, Lord, make us like you. Everybody said in Jesus' name. Amen. If the usher would come at this time, we're going to wait upon you for a Wednesday evening offering. Give you an opportunity to worship the Lord with your giving. Amen. I also do ask that you pray for my wife. She has a special unspoken need. Pray for healing in her body in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Don, would you pray over this offering? Amen. Please mark with your offering. God bless you.
Amen. The best is yet to come. Please remember youth service this Friday night, 7 p.m. We're going to have youth service at 7. We're having a special speaker, two special speakers. One is local here, then we have a special speaker from the state of Texas. Looking forward to hearing him, but the fear is going to be preaching on Friday. Also, after the service on Friday night, we'll have an event in the Family Center with games and fun and excitement and pizza. We're going to have an awesome time. I'm looking forward to that. Also, Lady's Secret Sister Reveal is going to take place on Saturday, January the 11th, and that's going to be at the El Petrero Restaurant in Swartz Creek, Michigan, and that's going to take place at 6.30 p.m. Also, the Able Support Family Group, that's going to happen on January the 16th. That's Thursday, January the 16th, and that's going to take place at 6.30 p.m. Also, we're going to have a youth rally Friday, January the 17th. And that's going to take place at Lapeer Apostolic Church at 7.30 p.m. Also, another TCG activity is going to take place on Saturday, January the 18th. And that's going to be baking cookies at Sister Gloria Waller's house at 12 p.m. And may the Lord bless you tonight. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. Everybody glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. It, uh, it's a little bit cold out there. Sister Ayer said that only the penguins like this kind of temperature. And, uh, we've had a pretty good winter so far. And I'm trusting that God will just touch the rest of the winter. It'll be all right. It'll be like Florida. It'll be all right with that. No. <laughs> this is the year ago. Go summer. Right. Go summer in the middle of winter. Tonight is our uh, Elisha service. I look forward to this every month. We've got uh, quite a lineup tonight. We have three five spots. Sister Kaylee, Sister Ashley, Sister Brooke, and then Brother Garrett is going to be doing uh, a sermon tonight. Then he's preaching Friday, so he thought he was coming here for rest and a little bit of vacation, but he, we're putting him to work, work for the kingdom of God. So the order tonight, I always keep it till right now, it keeps them on their toes, they're, they're all nervous, but we're going to open up with Sister Ashley, then we'll go with Sister Brooke, then we'll go with Sister Kaylee, and then Brother Garrett, and I won't introduce you between, just hand the mic one to one. So could we stand to our feet? And welcome to Sister Ashley as she comes for a box spot. Place. You can just ask for strength. 
Like James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Prayer is not getting God ready to do your will. It's getting you ready to do God's will. And prayer is the key that unlocks the gates of heaven and it closes the gates of hell. Prayer has the power to cure sickness and disease. Prayer does not need proof. It needs practice. If you're thinking that God is far away and can't hear you, just remember that he is as close as your next prayer. If your marriage is under attack, pray. If your job is failing, pray. If you're fighting an illness or disease, pray. Or if you're just simply feeling lonely, just pray. Because God answers our prayers. Like myself, maybe you don't have time to pray as much as you want. And if we don't have time to pray, we might become weak or miserable or feel like we're being defeated. But that's why prayer is so, so powerful. So the power of prayer is much more simple than it seems. Just remember God is always there and he will answer your prayer. stand for the reading of the word. If you have your Bibles, please go to 1 John 4, 8. I would like to give honor to my pastor and to my bishop for this opportunity and to all the ministers behind me. You guys are amazing and what keeps this church going. So if you have your Bibles, 1 John 4, 8. It says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Pastor, we pray. trip to Chile and Argentina where my dad and grandpa had the opportunity to preach all over Chile and Argentina. And on our way home, we were in the airport. Me and my dad were just talking and I'm like, you know, I'm like, there's a song that was really starting to become more popular. We sing it here, it's called Reckless Love. And I'm like, I love the bridge of this song. Like, I love the, there's no shadow, you won't climb up. No shadow, you won't light up, no mountain, you won't climb up. I love that. But I don't know how I feel about calling God's love reckless. I just, to me, at that moment, it wasn't sitting right with me because when I think of God, I don't think of him being reckless. And he stopped and he looked at me and he's like, do you even know what reckless means? And I'm like, well, I'm like, you know, when I think of reckless, I think of someone who's rebellious, someone who's kind of crazy and just does whatever they want to do. Not a rule follower. And he's like, that's not what reckless means. What reckless means is reckless is that you don't have to think about doing something, you just do it. And it was like that moment, like the light bulb went off and I was like, oh my goodness, that is powerful. And I asked him the other day if he even remembered this conversation, he has no idea we even talked about this. But this moment, to me, was like, it changed my whole perspective. Because God's love is reckless. Because when you look at this, you have to look at it. He told me you have to look at it from someone who, who has a broken heart. Someone who has sinned, who has messed up over and over and over. Someone like me, who is extremely unworthy. Where I sometimes will put myself in a corner and I'm like, I messed up so much. I put things over you, God. I haven't put you first in my life. Like Ashley said, sometimes you just don't make time for prayer when you should. You don't make time for him. It's like, Lord, I put so many things before you. I don't deserve your love. But with him, he doesn't even have to think about loving us. He just does it. And First John, it says that anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. And it's so powerful to know that God is love and that, you know, like Sister Ashley said, it's beautiful that we can communicate with him, and it's, you know, it's beautiful that we can, it's beautiful that he loves us, but when you actually sit down and you think about his love, like that he just looks at you and he's like, I love you, 
It's like, but God, look at what I've done. Look at who I am. But I love you. He doesn't have to think about loving us. He just does. And I have the tendency to care to the point to where I'm over-caring. So, like, you know, the moment of care, and then I'm, like, over here, and I'm, like, stressing out and caring too much. And I am getting very disappointed because I over-care. And I was told the other day that I need to pray for the eyes of the Lord. I need to pray that I can see things how God sees things. And that I would love like God loves. And so that has been one of my prayers lately is, Lord, let me love what you love. Let me not have to, because we're human. We like to sit here and be like, judgmental, when God's just like, I love you. I know you mess up, but I love you. And so I just like to encourage anybody that just, it's comforting to know that we have a God who loves us no matter what. Thank you, Pastor. Um, I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to say tonight, or if I would even come close to what God wanted me to say. So I'm just going to share with you what I feel God laid on my heart. There, there was a time, actually not all that long ago, where I constantly doubted God, and I constantly com uh, doubted God's ability to use me. Um, I don't know if anyone else has ever felt God calling you or leading you to do something for the kingdom. And you've just kind of said, but wait, God, I can't do that. God, you can't use me to do this. God, don't you remember where you found me? Don't you remember where I was at? Don't you remember where I turned my back on you? Do you not remember where I doubted you? Where I ignored you? Where I ignored your call? And even when I would just feel God asking asking me to go pray for somebody. It could have been one of my closest friends. It could have been one of my siblings. And I was like, no God, I can't do that. I'm not pastor. I can't go pray for my friend at the youth. I'm not Brother Larry. I'm not Brother Anthony. Even if God was just simply asking me to give a little more. God, I can't, I can't give that. God, I can't do that. And God, I, I, I felt God kind of bring to my mind Balaam's dumb, Numbers 22, 28. God spoke through a donkey, but yet I have the audacity to constantly doubt God's ability to use me. But yet, 1 Peter 2, 9 says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. If God took the time to call you out of where you're at, he called you out of that for a reason. God's not going to bring you from where you came from to where you are now for you to sit on a pew and doubt his ability. Um, and at that point in my life, it still wasn't enough to shake me and to get me to stop telling God what he couldn't do through me. And God kind of brought to my attention Peter. He was one of the 12 disciples. He was an apostle. But Peter also denied God three times. And in John 21, Jesus asked Peter to basically reaffirm his commitment to him and his calling. 
Now, nowhere did I read, did Peter turn around and say, but God, I denied you. But God, I didn't just deny you once, I denied you twice. Then I denied you a third time. And God loved Peter so much that he, he didn't worry about what Peter did. He didn't worry about where Peter denied him, where Peter basically said, no, no God. But yet, Peter went on to be used mightily of God. On the day of Pentecost, Peter was used to stand up boldly to speak to those who were mocking us, who were speaking in tongues. It was Peter who God, who God spoke through to tell the people in Acts 2, 17, And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and on your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. It was Peter who God used to speak to the lame man and tell him, in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. It, if Peter hadn't had the faith in God or in God's ability and power, he would have never been used. The lame man might not have ever been healed. God's glory might not have ever been put on display for those who didn't believe. And um, there's been so many times where I've had the thought, God, I don't have that last name. God, I wasn't born into this. God, you loved me when I was unlovable. You loved me when I didn't love you back. And you still want to use me? But it's in those moments where God uses where you were in your darkness to use you while you're in his light for others who are in darkness. And I, I don't know who this is for, or if this was just for me, if God was just trying to open my eyes, but when Pastor preached go and read off our goals, I could feel doubt. Not doubt in God's ability to do it, but doubt in God's ability through us. Doubt in God's ability to use us to do what he wanted to do. Someone felt led of the Lord to, to do something, but your mind flooded with doubt. Someone felt led of the Lord to pursue a P7 club in their school. Someone felt led of the Lord to pursue missions. Someone felt led of the Lord to invite someone to church, to witness to a coworker, to speak in faith to someone. Someone received a calling on their life, but yet you doubt. Not that God is capable, but that God could use you. This might be a little bit bold, um, but don't sit here and hinder the kingdom of God. God gave the ultimate sacrifice for your sins out of love for you. God didn't call you out of darkness for you to sit in a corner and not serve him with your whole heart and put your hand to the plow and do a work for the kingdom. God created you with a purpose. Not just a purpose, but a kingdom purpose. He didn't forgive you and wash you white as snow and cover your sins with his blood and fill you with the gift of the Holy Ghost for you to throw your past in his face every time he tries to use you. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But then again, we go back to 1 Peter 2.9. But ye are a chosen generation. And in Isaiah 43, it says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called you by thy name, thou art mine. We are God's. We're not our own. If God loves you enough to save you and to use you, let him use you. Then in verse 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall thy flame kindle upon thee. So if God's calling you somewhere where you've never been before, if God's calling you to do something that you've never done, that you're uncomfortable with, as Sister Ann says, sometimes we have to be, or learn to be comfortable in the uncomfortable. uncomfortable. Because no matter what, God's not going to let those things overtake you. God's not going to let those things stop you. If he called you, he's going to do it. So, don't Hinder the move of God with the fear of the inability for you to be used by God. 
You are his child. You were bought with the price. You are his masterpiece. It's time to go, as Pastor said. So don't get stuck looking backwards, because eventually God might just stop asking you to do work for him. Don't ever be afraid to do something God asks for you or lay it on your heart to do. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He will never let you tread through deep waters alone. If God is in it, it will not fail. Something I like to remind myself is God can't help you go forward in him if you're constantly looking back. It's time to get our mind off the past that God forgave you of and brought you out of and get your mind on the kingdom. Because ultimately, we all have a kingdom purpose. Look at how stand for reading the word. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. I want to take this time to go ahead and give honor to my pastor and to my bishop for allowing me to speak and to speak into your guys' life and having to trust in me to really speak to your guys' life. Uh, it's Jeremiah uh, chapter 18, verses 1 through 6. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will let you hear my words. So I went down to the potter's house, and there he was working at his wheel. And the vessel he was making of clay was spoiled in the potter's hands, and he reworked it into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter has done, declares the Lord. Behold, like the clay in the potter's hands, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Pastor, if you could pray. You may be seated. Uh, the, the title of my sermon tonight is Stay on the Potter's Wheel. Stay on the Potter's Wheel. So the process of pottery, um, for those of you who don't know, which I was one of those who didn't know until uh, today actually, uh, the process of pottery is they take this large piece of clay and out of that clay they start tearing uh, molds, they start tearing pieces of clay and they start uh, taking it and start shaping the pieces that they've taken and broken. They start forming them into spheres, and then they, they slam them down on the on this pottery table in order to get the air bubbles out, so that way whenever it is heated, and so that way whenever they actually make the, the piece that they are trying to make, that the air bubbles don't expand, because in heat, the air bubbles expand, and it can cause the pottery to eventually break. And so as they're forming them into this sphere, and as they're they're taking this piece of clay, and they're throwing it down, and they're shaping it, and they're kneading it, and they're, they're making sure they get every imperfection out of the clay, they then begin to fill a pot with water. And they fill the pot with water, and then after that, they take the piece of clay, and they dip the clay in the water, and then they begin to put it on the wheel. And while it's on the wheel, they begin to shape it, they begin to mold it, and they begin to tear out the imperfections. They just begin to, to shape it, to mold it to what the, the potter has envisioned it to be. Whether it be a pot, whether it be a cup, a mug, or whatever it may be, whatever the potter has envisioned it to be, that's what he's going to try and make it to be. And so after that, they then leave the vessel out to dry for a few hours, and after it is dry, they then place it back on the wheel to smooth out the roughness and the edges, and the edges that are then left in, on the clay as it was, uh, as it dried. And then after that, they then take a handle, they then take another piece of clay, and the handle is made, and they take this piece of clay, and they throw it into a machine, and in that machine, they have this handle, and it, as they pull the handle down, it then begins to press the clay down, in that machine and it begins to form uh, whatever length or diameter that the, the mold is in the clay. And so after that, uh, the, after the handle is then made, it goes through a rough process of being cut and being shaped and being molded into the handle and then it is then, after it is, the edges are roughed off, it is then placed onto the, the for a handle and it is glued on. And then after that, the potter stamps his symbol on the vessel. And after that, the vessel is then placed in a furnace for a few days, which it is heated at 14,000 degrees. And then after, after a few days, they, bring, they take the pot out, and then the vessel is then painted and placed back into the furnace for another few days at that same temperature. 
And then after that, whenever it comes out, it comes out to be this beautiful piece of pottery and this beautiful piece of whatever the potter envisioned it to be, whether it be a cup or book or whatever. And see, one person that in the Bible that I feel like went through this process was Joseph. You see, he was a young boy, and he's, he's the youngest of his brothers, and he comes out, and they're all working in the field one day, and he says, I've had a dream. And his dream, he's like, you know, I had this amazing and wonderful dream. He's like, I'm going to tell you guys what it was about. And as he begins to tell them what the dream was, he then says, you guys were bowing down to me. Like, how awesome is that? I'm the youngest brother, and all my older brothers were bowing down to me. Now, as an older sibling, I can, I can definitely assure you that anger and rage and all sorts of emotions would have flooded me. I'd be like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to be bowing down to you. You're crazy. I don't know what you're, what you're dreaming, but th those are just dreams. Joseph, go back in the field. Go get back to work and quit, quit dreaming and go back and do what you're supposed to be doing. And so I can imagine Joseph, you know, he's all sad. He's like, well, I had this amazing dream. And then he goes back out and starts working. And then the next day he says, oh, I had another dream. And he begins to tell them what the dream was about. And he says, you guys were bowing down to me again. Like, how awesome is that? And then, as you know, they, I imagine them getting enraged and saying, you know what, we're done with this joke, you know. We're going we're gonna to devise a plan to sell him into slavery. And so, as they devise a plan to sell him into slavery, uh, as they sell him into slavery, you know, as the story goes, he gets thrown into, or he gets sold into slavery, and they take the coat that his father had made him, because he was his father's favorite son. He, they took his coat and they said, Father, your, your son has been killed. Your son, he's, he's been killed by a pack of wild animals, and something happened to him, and we weren't there to be able to defend him and help him. And so as he sold him to slavery, uh, this man Potiphar ends up buying him as his slave, and he goes from the lowest of the low to, like, the highest of the high. Like, he goes from, like, being the very bottom to, like, the second in command. And I, I haven't really ever been, like, the second in command or really ahead. First, I've always been, like, on the bottom. So I can't really imagine what Joseph really went through, but I can imagine him being at the top, and he's like, you know what, I've actually done something for myself. You know, I've, I've, I've been good, I've been good to my master, you know, I've been doing all these things that he's asked me to do, and he's, he's moved me up in his house. And, you know, as Joseph's, you know, going throughout his day, uh, Potiphar's wife approaches him and says, you know, hey, you, you look kind of cute, you know, I kind of like you. And so, as he does that, you know, he's like, well, you're the only thing that my master has withheld from me. And I'm not, I'm not going to pursue you. I'm not going to go after you. And so, you know, he goes on and then keeps doing about his business, whatever his master has asked him to do. And it happens again for a second time. And Joseph says, you know what? No, I can't. I'm not going to, I can't do this. And she grabs a hold of his coat and she tears a piece off. Well, as the story goes, she goes and tells Potiphar, you know, he tried to, he tried to have his way with me. He tried to have me and tried to take me and he wanted, tried to do things to me. And so... Potiphar was, I could, Potiphar was probably enraged. He's like, are you kidding me? Like, you became my second in command, and I, I let you, I trusted you with my house while I was gone, and this is how you treat me, this is how you repay me. And so because of that, he's thrown into a jail. And as he's thrown into jail, you know, I can imagine him, he's like, man, I'm at this again. And I just made something for myself, like, God, Lord, why did you have to do this to me? God, Lord, you did something so great for me, and yet now I'm back in this prison, I'm back in this jail. And so, you know, he's in there for, I don't know how long he's in there for, but he's in there for a certain amount of time. I can imagine, you know, he's sitting there waiting, you know. And then a baker and a cupbearer end up being thrown into prison with him. And the cupbearer has a dream. And he says, you know, I have this dream. I had this, this dream, and I don't know what it means. Joseph, can you interpret it? And I can imagine Joseph, you know, sitting in the corner like, yeah, I can interpret it. I used to, I used to do that. That used to be my thing. And so he begins to tell the cupbearer that... You know, you're going to go back, and you are going to be, your position is going to be restored as the Pharaoh's cupbearer. And I can imagine the cupbearer being excited and saying, are you, are you kidding me? Like, I'm going to be out of this place, like, soon? I'm going to be restored to my position? That's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm going to remember you, Joseph, whenever, whenever I get back. I'm going to remember you, and I'm, never, I'm not going to forget you. And so, you know, as the story goes, uh, the baker has a dream and tells the dream to Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dream. He says, you know, you're going to end up dead. I can't really do anything for you. And that also comes to pass. And so I can imagine, you know, Joseph sitting in the corner again. He's like, I wonder whenever that cupbearer is going to gonna come and let me out. You know, I wonder, if, I wonder if he's remembered me. I wonder if he's going to tell Pharaoh about me and everything that I can do and everything that the Lord's ability has been able to work through me. I wonder if, 
I wonder if it could do something for me. And you know, months, weeks, years go by, and I imagine Joseph has lost all hope. And then the cupbearer, or Pharaoh, starts having a dream. And he tries to get all of his soothsayers and all the people that he knows to try and interpret his dream, but none of them can understand what the dream means. And so the cupbearer is like, oh, hey, I know somebody. I remember Joseph. He was a man who was in the prison, and he interpreted my dream. And so Joseph is brought out and goes to Pharaoh and tells him his dream, and he says, there's going to be seven plentiful good years of, of the land. The, seven, the land is going to have seven good years, but after that, there's going to be seven bad years. Seven years of famine, seven years of destruction, seven years of not good things. And I can imagine Joseph, he comes up with a plan and says, well, you know, if we, if we take a certain portion of each year and store it back, or each month, and we store it back, we will have enough to get us through the, the drought and through the dry land, or through the dry spell. And I can imagine Pharaoh, he's sitting back and he's like, you know what? You're the man for that. And so immediately Joseph goes from being a prisoner to the second in command in all of Egypt. You know, sometimes we are like Joseph and sometimes we're like the clay. You see that piece of clay that's taken from the larger block. See, God does that with us. Whenever we're, whenever we're formed, he's going to take us from the larger block. And he's going to try and need and he's going to try and push us. And he's going to try and get all the imperfections out of us that he can He's going to try and make us, and he's going to try and mold us before we get on the wheel. He's going to try and shape us, and he's going to try and mold us into what he wants us to be. And he's, he's got this image for us in his mind, and he says, you know, I know what I want this to be. It's going to be something that I have designed it to be. It's going to be something that I'm going to design for a purpose. And so whenever he's, he's sitting there, he's trying to get all the imperfections out, and he starts filling the pot with water, and I can imagine God sitting back, and he's like, I know what I'm going to make this to be. It's going to be something amazing. It's going to be something glorious. Like, this is, this is my design. This is something that I have created. And he dips the clay in the water. He dips us in the water, and then he places us on the wheel. And he's going to sit on the wheel, sometimes for hours at a time, sometimes for weeks at a time. And he's going to sit there, and he's going to shape us. And he's going to begin to mold us. We're going to begin to, like the clay, we're not going to want to move it first. We're going to be like, God, what are you doing? God, I don't want to be moved here. God, but I don't like what you're doing to me. God, please just let this all stop. I don't like what I'm going through right now. I don't like what's been going on in my life. I don't like what's been going on in my spirit. I don't like what's been going on in my family or in my job situation. Or I don't like where I'm at in life right now. God, just stop. You're not helping. You're, you're just adding to the pain and adding to everything that I'm going through. But as he begins to shape and he begins to mold it, he begins to get all the imperfections out and he, he leaves it to dry and we're like, whew, God's finally done with me. You know, I, I'm doing, I'm baited out of that one. I'm doing just fine. And then he begins to take us back again, and he begins to put us back on that wheel and try to smooth out the roughness and tries to smooth out the edges. And again, we're like, God, though, why are you doing this to me? God, though, I don't like what you're doing. I, I don't want to be on this wheel anymore. God, though, let me, let me out. I don't, I don't like where I'm at right now. And then the handle is made, and through that rough process, the handle is then stuck on us, and we're like, well, another piece has been added to us. And then it's, another piece has been added to us, and then he stamps his symbol on us. He fills us with his spirit. And he stamps his name and his trust. And he stamps his, his symbol upon us. And then after that, we're placed into the furnace for a few days. Or a few weeks. Or however long he decides to keep us in there. And we're like, God, Lord, I don't, I don't like this. God, Lord, I feel like I'm going to be crushed under the weight of what's going on right now. I feel like the fire is too hot. Lord, what you're taking me through right now, God, Lord, I don't feel like I can handle it. But God knows that we can handle it. He knows the exact temperature that we can handle. He is not going to allow the burdens on us to be more than what we can bear. And so as we're going through that, you know, we're saying, God, Lord, I can't, I can't do this. I can't make it out of this. Lord, what, what are you trying to do to me, God, Lord? I don't understand why I'm going through this again. And then he then takes us out. And we think, oh, wow. You know, after all that stuff, you know, we, we really made it out of that one. We just made that one out by the skin of our teeth. And, you know, we begin to be painted. And we're like, ooh, this is kind of nice. You know, I, I like this. You know, God's really doing something for me. You know, he's making me into something that he wants me to be. And then he places us back in the furnace for a few days. And again, we're under that pressure. God, Lord, I don't know what you're doing. God, Lord, I don't feel like I can take the heat. I don't feel like I can take the pain. I don't feel like I can take the pressure anymore. And as it just keeps going, and God's like, you know, I'm, I'm still shaping you. I'm still molding you. I'm still doing what I want to do with you. And he's still shaping us, and he's still molding us. Yeah. And then after, after he's finished with us, he takes the vessel, and he says, this is exactly what I intended it to be. It might not be what we envision it to be, 
Because as we're on the womb, we may say, God, Lord, I don't want to be dead. I, I don't want to do what you're calling me to do. I don't want to do this. But the entire time, he's shaping us and he's saying, this is my purpose. This is what I want for you. This is what I want for your life. And see, what we are going through in that process of being the clay, in that process of being shaped and molded, and through that process of the furnace and being heated up and cooled down and heated and cooled down and heated and cooled down, God is shaping us and molding us into what he wants us to be. And what we're going through is going to be, help, be able to help others after us. Because what we go through isn't just for us, but it's for those that come after us. Just like the decisions that we make don't just affect us in the now, but it affects those in the future. It affects those who are in front of us. It affects the generations past us. And as I'm coming to a close, we just come. Let y'all can stand. You see, some of you have been wondering, why am I going through such a tough time right now? Why does it feel like the entire weight of the world is on my shoulders right now? Why does it feel like I can't keep going? Every single day, I wake up and I say, I wonder what's going to hit me today. I wonder if I'm going to be able to make it through this today or what, what's ahead of me. I don't think I'm going to make it through. And you're just wanting the trials and the tribulations to stop. And you don't want to go through the process of the fire. You don't want to go through the process of being molded anymore. You're saying, God, but I don't want to go through this process anymore. I'm tired. I'm weak and I'm weary. God, Lord, it's been a rough year. I don't know if I'm going to be able to make it through this one. God, Lord, I just need your help, and I need you to, to work something out. And you, you don't want to be through that process anymore. But if you just stay in the potter's hands and let him shape you and mold you, if you just stay in the furnace and go through the process, he's going to turn it into something beautiful. Because what you're going through right now, it's not, it's not over. God's not done with what he's doing on you. But he's taking what you're going through and he's shaping it into something beautiful. He is shaping it into something for his purpose and his design. Even though it may not be what we want. Even though it may not be our desires. He's still shaping us and molding us. Even Jesus said, whenever he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Jesus didn't want to die on the cross. The flesh of Jesus did not want to die on the cross. Because he was, though he was God, he was still a man. He was, his flesh was kind of taken over and he was saying, I don't, I don't want to die. But then his spirit got back and he said, but Lord, not mine, but thy will be done. How many of you believe that tonight? You want to receive that tonight? Not my will, but thine be done. These altars are open. If you're feeling like you're on the potter's wheel and you're going through a tough time or a situation, these altars are open. See, God is wanting to do something in his place. Can we all just gather around these altars right now? Can we just receive the word of the Lord right now? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Just let the potter shape you and mold you. The potter hasn't forgotten about you. He hasn't forgotten about you. Just go through the process. He's still shaping you. He's still molding you into what he wants you to be. He's still doing his will. He's still doing his work on you. God's not finished.